What's up, TDF? This is Rajiv Joseph, playwright of King James, and I'm coming to you from my apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Hey, everybody. I'm Glenn Davis. I am um, coming to you from uh, Midtown Manhattan, uh, not far from where uh, we are doing the play King James. I play Sean. Um, I am a black man. I am. I am in my 30s, I would say I look like, um, and uh, have on a black leather coat. I'm sitting on a grayish couch uh, with a white background and a um, gray t-shirt and a black hat. And um, yeah. Nice. Good to see you, Glenn. You too, Rajiv. Um, we were just talking about the, uh, the end of the Warriors dynasty. If you know. <laughs> between the Lakers and the Warriors tonight. By the time this anyone sees this, they'll know what had happened if they care. Um, yeah. But oh. we get to catch some of that game after the show tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the game starts at 10. We coincidentally come down from our show at 10. Um, and um, yeah, it'll be exciting times. This is actually because, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get into this later, this is quite um, uh, serendipitous that we're doing our play on um, the eve of what is potentially the end of a dynasty um, if LeBron, who plays for the Lakers now, is able to defeat the Warriors and Steph Curry and, and some of the other folks who are named in our play um, who play for the Warriors, because that was, you know, uh, that's a big, big part of the play of King James, you know, mm -hmm. how you and I actually started first talking about um, sports and the intersection between sports and theater. And we were doing um, Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo all those years ago. So it's it's funny that we come all this way and we're still watching LeBron versus Steph Curry or no. LeBron versus the Warriors, you know? Exactly. And that leads to this, uh, this first question. You two have been collaborating for more than a decade. How did you meet and what makes your artistic partnership so successful? And um, I would say that we met doing uh, the, our, my play of Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo in Los Angeles at Culver City. And we were running out during tech to watch the Cavs play in the playoffs. I think but back then it was against the Pistons, the Rip Hamilton Pist Pistons. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, uh, we bonded over that along with Brad Fleischer and Ari Moyan, um, watching basketball, talking hoops. And uh, years later, you approached me about writing and play. And I was like, I think it needs to be about LeBron. I think you approached me about writing a play about the goat, and I was like, "Okay, well, I'll write a play about LeBron." <laughs> Is that what happened? Uh, wow! Uh, I saw what you, I saw what you did just there. Um, yeah, man, that was man. It feels like a lifetime ago, but we were both really early in our careers. I think at that point, uh, Bengal Tiger would have been um, the the sort of biggest thing in your career. The, uh, and we were only doing it at the Kirk Douglas Theater, which is like the small 250 or 300 seat theater in Culver City. And um, at that point I was, uh, I was early in my career as well. And yeah, we were doing this play about, you know, the, the war in Iraq and between, you know, uh, rehearsal periods and on off days, we would find a bar and go, go watch uh, the playoffs. And it, it feels like, I think I might have this, might have this wrong, but it feels like, um, every iteration of King James we've done has been during the playoffs of the NBA. So, um, not uh, the first one though, because uh, in Chicago it was in March, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay, so that was that was winter going into spring. Right. The playoffs were about to start, and then by the time we did King James in LA, the playoffs were were happening. Yeah. And then um, and now the playoffs are happening again. But yeah, I remember it would be me. You, Brad Fleischer, who's a big Boston fan, so all he ever would talk about is how Larry Bird is, you know, one of the goats, or you know, yeah. on the on the route Mount Rushmore. I think that has now has now been debunked. But uh, <laughs> and then uh, and then Arian was from Chicago, so he and I would we, right. would be talk would be screaming Michael Jordan. Right. Um, and you, we had this upstart at the time, or you know. Mm -hmm. At that point, he'd been in the, I think he came into the league in 2003. Yeah. So uh, around 2009, he was six years into his career. Right. And, um, upstart in terms of the GOAT conversation. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 
but he was well established into his career with the Cleveland Cavaliers. And we would be talking about like, does he have what it takes? Like he had the highest ceiling of anyone maybe ever having come into the NBA, but also the highest expectations because he was on the, the front of Sports Illustrated in high school as a senior in high school. So, you know, the, the fact that we're still here all these years later from, you know, he started in 2003, it's now 2023, over 20 years, you and I talk about this often, his his entire career has spanned, you know, a, a large, my entire, I would say my entire adulthood, but you're a bit older than me, a large part of your adulthood as well. So I think that um, the longevity uh, of, a, of a LeBron James and the fact that he's done it at such a high level for so long simply just cannot be disputed. So if, if we're talking the GOAT conversation along those lines, I think there's really him and Kareem and and um, he, I think he takes the cake. Well, and the funny thing also about this is that like, it's, it's, I think it's kind of rare to have four guys doing the same play who are all huge basketball fans. Um, and I think that when you're talking about like the theater audience and the sporting, you know, watching audience, th th those two don't always collide. And I think that, you know, one thing I've been saying about King James is that like, you don't need to like sports to enjoy the play, but, um, I do think it was it, there was some uh, wonderful synchronicity or you know, kismet, whatever you want to call it, about the four of us kind of coming together like we did, and all of us being such rabid sports fans. And I think that informed the creation of this play because I think we see theater and sports kind of very closely intertwined. Yeah, the 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 theater of sports is really something that. Um, I'm attracted to, but like the, you know, we, we talk about, I think in your, in, in your initial first draft of um, King James, I think you had something to the effect of you wanted it to feel like, like you're walking into a, an arena, like a, a sport yeah. event. And so we had, we talked about at different times, what's happening before the show, what's happening at, at intermission, which, which plays like a halftime show for us. Um, what's, what's happening at the end of the game? How do we leave that event? And so um, very rarely, I, I, I've said this a few times, very rarely do sports and, and theater, as we know theater today, um, sort of come together. And usually not to great effect, but this, in, in this case, I've heard so much from people who are not sports fans at all, who come and say, I came into this play, I either didn't know what it was about, or I thought it was about religion, or I thought it was about something Shakespearean. Um, and then they go, Oh, or I thought it was something to do with someone in the monarchy. And then I go, Oh my God, it was, it's LeBron. And, yeah. um, and, and it, 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 it's sort of, I think, um, your most commercial play and that it, it, um, your way in to these guys is LeBron, your way into these relationships between these two men is, uh, a sort of King of sorts, um, mm -hmm. very similar to, um, um, guards at the Taj in terms of how you use the sort of two play, two character structure, but then there's a sort of what I call the monster in the closet, the guy, who, the, the, the entity, the thing that you never see, but right. it's sort of driving force behind these characters, ideas, thoughts, notions, and ambitions in their own lives. So um, yeah, it's sort of a Trojan horse in that way, uh, but I think very adroitly done. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. You laugh a lot in this one. All right, I'll take the next one. Oh, that's you, that's you, I'll, that's you. Uh, Rajiv, you wrote the part of Sean in King James for Glenn. What inspired the play and how did you pitch it to him? Well, I think we kind of just talked about what inspired the play because that was our, our getting to know each other through the lens of both theater and, uh, and sports. But I think, I remember the day I pitched it to you, Glenn, we talked on the phone um, and uh, I had this thought that you know, because I had been rooting for LeBron for so many years at that point, still am. But back back then, I was still I was still I was aware of how much this guy had been in my life, hmm. and I think that you know I think I was feeling kind of pre nostalgia for him leaving. You know, I was like, it's going to be sad when LeBron is no longer playing basketball. It's going to be sad when this guy is no longer in my life as a, as an athlete. And um, when I think about stuff, when when I feel that pang of nostalgia. Um, my my instinct is to write about it because that's a way of you know, in some ways of holding on to something or someone, and so I was like, oh, maybe I should write a play 
and I, and then I thought about you, you know, you had talked about doing this play, doing a play together. And I was like, this would be perfect because I know that Glenn, Glenn would be down for this. And so I called you up and I explained kind of in general terms what the play might be about. And I said, um, I said, I, th I think the name of the play is LeBron. <laughs> I remember that. And I said, I think my response was, that's genius. I don't know if we can do it. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then it was like, you know, that, that was like some kind of like, it, it wasn't illegal, but there was a question of like, it, would that be capitalizing on a guy's name or, you know, some, you know, am I, am I infringing on his intellectual property by using his name? And then I was like, well, you know, his nickname is King James and that's even even better title and a lot more, you know, broad. So I think it is a better title. Yeah. I think, um, at, at all, all that. Yes. And I think that when you first called me up and you said, I have the idea, um, I don't know if you remember this, but I was in London doing, um, uh, uh, down. Downstate? Yeah. And, um, and you called me and you said, Hey man, I got this. Cause I, I think, so we should go back even further. So what happened was, um, you were, you had written the, uh, um, uh, guards of the Taj. Right. And I saw it and loved it. And I was like, Oh man, I had never even considered doing a two person play at that point. Mm -hmm. And you had written this beautiful play. And I saw it the first time in New York with, uh, Arya Moyed and Omar Metwali both amazing actors. And I remember watching it going, oh my God, that's a beautiful two-hander. And the only other two-hander that I had ever seen that I ever said I wanted to do was this play, um, or was really affected by was this play Top Dog Underdog. So um, then I thought, okay, if I'm going to do a two-hander, I want Rajiv to write it. <laughs> so I think, so I probably like jokingly said, hey man, you should write a two-hander for me one day. And, you know, didn't really think much about it. And then we were watching you and I had gone to see um, uh, the humans. humans with uh, Sharon Yeah, and so Sharon saw it, and me and me and Ari were riffing and 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 talking talking about each other. And then you, you that was that was when we initially started to have the conversation about what would a two hander look like. Yeah. Um, and then um, eventually, you know, uh, uh, other things happened, and the, the conversation shifted and changed, and. And then um, you called me up and said, "Hey, man, I think I know what a two-hander would be, and it would be um, it would be called LeBron." And I don't even think you told me what it was. Uh, I think you just said I, I would call LeBron. I was like, "I'm in, I'm in." <laughs> and then you began to talk to me about what it would be, and right. I just thought it was conceptually. I was like, N I I couldn't understand how you were going to do it, but I trusted that you could do it, and there was. And then you would talk about your way in and finding what the guys would talk about. And I don't know if you remember this, but well, I'm sure you do. But initially, when you pitched it to me, it was one long scene. Yeah. It was just one, I don't know, you know, maybe idea. <laughs> 75, 90 minute play of one scene in real time. And you watch these guys. And um uh and I just remember going, This is awesome. And so I pitched it to to Anna Shapiro at step move at the time and then i pitched it to michael ritchie at center theater group and they both were like yes let's yeah. do it um and then of course something uh happened in 2020 that really shifted um the world and mm -hmm. um and so we had to postpone it and during that time um uh kenny came on and i had seen chris in a play um called the low road uh, i can't remember if you saw it but i saw chris in the low road at the public mm -hmm. and we were like, oh, this is, you know, we did a we did a reading of it of some sort, I think over on online. And it was like, this is this is the team. And so anyway, full circle, those conversations having started from 2009 yeah. to now being doing this play finally in New York in 2023, it, it just shows you the long gestation process for an idea yeah. Yeah. for someone like yourself. Yeah. This is the third time you're doing King James after runs in Chicago and LA. How has the show, how has the show changed over the past year and have audience reactions been markedly different in each city? I would say that the play, um, once we locked it in Chicago, I think the play, no, well, I'll say we did several workshops of it pre pandemic and those workshops really uh, were fruitful because that's when the play shifted from a one long scene 
to the four quarter notion, to uh, thinking about are there things happening at intermission or before the show. Um, so there was a, there was a good amount of shifting, and and I think you would say yourself when you're in process on a play, the thing that we come in with, at least in my experience with working with you, many times looks very different than the thing we ended up with. Uh, yeah. Sometimes even yeah. in the, the actual rehearsal process, I think when we started rehearsal in Chicago, I think in the second week, Kenny said, "This play is is." I, I love everything it's doing. I want I want it to be an event, so I want to add something. And he added the DJ at the uh, at the top. And I think when we first heard it, we were like, "Oh man, how's that going to work?" And then it, now I can't even imagine this play without the DJ because yeah. um, yeah. there's such yeah. a huge yeah. part of what, She's great part of it. Yeah. what the event is. Um, but the play itself feels like once we got into once we got between the lines, me and Chris, you know. Yeah. So, Sports reference in between the lines. We the, the play has really remained the same, like uh, from Chicago to LA to New York, in terms of what what we uh, decided the central themes of the play, the thrust of the play. Um, the words may have changed, you know, s small things in their vernacular here and there, but the play itself, I would say, about ninety percent of what you what someone might have seen in Chicago is what they're going to see here. I would say the thing that has shifted is the audience reaction right. um, in each place. You know, you know, there, there's a line I say in Chicago that says something to the effect of LeBron is the greatest basketball player of all time. And in Chicago, people booed. They were like, nah, you're, you know, you, you're talking crazy, you know, like outwardly during the play. And then, you know, that same line set in Los Angeles, people were like, yes, as if there was anyone else. Yes, that's yeah. Yeah quite obvious and they would cheer. And then here we say a couple of things about, you know, the Knicks, we say, you know, and th those get some, some pretty um, uh, um, big reactions. So it's more about, you know, and also I would say Chicago and New York are a, uh, a theater going, like a theater going community, whereas LA, which was a larger house, um, uh, was, was it people, people from th that don't routinely go to plays. Uh, were 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 found themselves in the theater to to watch this play about LeBron. You know, a lot yeah. of uh, the sort of LeBron aspect of it really got people in. I hear here more often than not, people go in New York. People go, I didn't know what this play was about. I was just told I had to see it. Whereas in LA, everyone knew they were yeah. coming to to watch a play about LeBron. Yeah. There's just so much theater in New York. I mean, oftentimes we all walk into a theater uh, to see a play that we're like, I have no idea what this is. Um, and I think that what's interesting about the New York audience is some nights we have a very sports savvy audience. Last night, I could tell we did not because last night at the very end, you do this thing with the with the chalk, with the chalk, <laughs> round chalk toss, and it's this beautiful gesture. No one had anything to do about that last night. And I was like, man, no one here knows that that's what, Le no, everyone thought you were just kind of doing something strange. And, and other, other audiences will cheer and like, you know, uh, react accordingly. And I was just like, as I watched that moment, I was like, no one here knows what Glenn is doing right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I totally forgot about that, but you are absolutely yeah. right. They did not, they did, I got, not, usually okay. I get some people like, oh, shit, yeah. here it comes, you know. Exactly. No crickets. Yeah. But that being said, that was a great audience last night. It was. Uh, they just weren't a basketball audience. So right. I do I do get this feeling that we do, you know, we get we get one of three things. We get a lot of theater people, which is one reaction and and I think this is a theater person show. But then you also get um a sports crowd. Mm -hmm. People who know who who will see that moment and go, oh, I love people. We get people come in with their with their jerseys on to come see this play, nice. um, and then we get people who just have no no idea, you know, what these things are about, but they they just want to see a great story. So, um, yeah, every audience from night to night can be can be um, uh, can be quite different, but I would say on the whole. The new New York audience has been lively. They've been very yeah. reactive. They've been very into it. Last night, like you said, they didn't know what some of these. You know, I, I say this. I repeat this line that LeBron says at the beginning of uh, one of the scenes. I say, um, 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 "I'm going to take my talents to South Beach." Take my talents to South Beach, and depending on that reaction from the crowd, I know 
right. type of crowd I have out there. You know, if it's crickets, they don't yeah. know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> They're not sports fans. Yeah. But if they go, oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Girl, and you're like, you see me, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In King James, basketball brings two men together who otherwise wouldn't have met. Have any of your friendships ever been sparked by sports? Well, I mean, ours have. I mean, <laughs> we, me, me and you and Ari and Brad, I mean, we, we were brought together by theater, by my play, but I think that sports had a great deal to do with it. And I think that, like, I know that for both of us, I think sports has been, played a large part in a lot of the friendships that we've had over the years. Um, I know it's, it's something that has bonded me with certain people. I mean, my screenwriting partner, Scott Rothman, I met him in grad school. And we, he and I, you know, Scott, like Scott and I, we, we bonded over a lot of things, including our shared interest in writing. But I think the thing that got us together outside of school, the thing that got us into a bar together was to watch a game, you know. And then he and I ended up writing a sports movie called Draft Day, which was about the NFL draft. So um, it's about that, Cleveland, the Cleveland Browns having the first pick in the NFL draft. Right. Yeah. It's another Cleveland sports tale that I dreamt up. <laughs> it's becoming a habit, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, theater put us in the same room together, but I think sports kept us engaged yeah. even be, even after we left the theater. And um, similar with Brad, like when I first did Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo, I got the script from Brad Fleischer. Mm. And, and I got it from because we were playing pickup basketball. That's right. That's right. All right. I was like, dude, um, you should read this play. It's amazing. It's this new writer named Rajiv Joseph. And I was like, okay, great. And audition for it. And he and I just so happened to end up doing that play together. So, you know, Larry Bird and Michael Jordan really brought me and me and Brad together. Um, I heard he lifted you up in that game. <laughs> Factually, correct. He said you couldn't guard him. Factually incorrect, my friend. <laughs> but um, but yes, yeah, sports. Uh, you know, I would argue that sports has had so much to do with a lot of the relationships. You know, um, my best friend in the world and producing partner is Terrell Alba McCraney, mm -hmm. and Terrell is not a has historically has not been a sports fan. You know, I don't think you think of Terrell and think of sports. But I remember when LeBron went to Miami, it gave me and Terrell something to talk about because that 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 other other than theater and some of the other things we're engaged in, but it gave us one more wrinkle in our relationship because we had never talked about sports. And now LeBron was playing for his hometown city of Miami. And so he had family members who worked for the Miami Heat. He, he you know, I, I used to go to go down to Miami and watch Heat games when LeBron was there and D-Way. And we were engaged in sports in a way that we hadn't been. And now we still talk about basketball to this day because he follows some of these guys. So, yeah, sports is is the thing the sort of mechanism for so many of my relationships where you know me and someone might not have anything to talk about and there we go those bulls man oh did you see that game and then we're did all that, did that with your thing with Terrell, like bringing miami bringing you guys together with the heat like did that have anything to do with him writing high flying bird his basketball movie yeah i mean that's that's a good point i'm glad you brought that up yeah so he got engaged with basketball mm -hmm. then um high flying bird was a film that uh our very good friend andre holland starred in but he he and steven soderbergh had done this this movie called i mean this tv series called the nick and andre um actually came to me one day and said hey man do you th i got this this um soderbergh wants to do a sports movie and we need a writer you think terrell would do it and i was like you know i think he can write anything and so terrell me terrell uh john hill uh, um, Andre, we all flew down to Florida one mm. year and uh, because Terrell didn't know a lot about basketball, like he right. had just recently gotten into it. So we basically took a weekend, a long weekend and gave Terrell a tutorial yeah. on basketball, the ins and outs of basketball yeah. and the mechanisms that sort of uh, uh, keep it keep it going day to day. So, um, yeah, that was that was another way in. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Rajiv, you grew up in Cleveland and the play's old tchotchke shop Armand's feels so authentic. Is it based on a real place and was there a cast and creatives outing to Cleveland at any point? <laughs> so yeah, so the, the 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 play King James takes place in two locations. Um, the first is a bar called La Cave de Vin, which was an actual wine bar in Cleveland Heights in on Coventry that um, had been around since I was in college. Um, and um, and was a kind of a, 
a favorite haunt of me and a couple of my friends. And we'd go there a lot. And it was sort of like, just like it's described in the play, a sort of subterranean, like stone-walled, you know, cave. Um, and um, and so I, and then it recently went out of business um, over the pandemic, but I, I set the first half of the play there in part because it was one of my favorite bars, but also because like, it was in, in some ways, it's also a, a tip of the hat to LeBron, who is a connoisseur of wine, you know, and um, and I and in, in my own little way, I was like, that's a little more original and a little more true to LeBron than like your average sports bar, you know. Um, and then the second half of the play takes place in Armand's, which is a reupholstery shop slash tchotchke shop, um, antique furniture and random, random tchotchkes that are for sale. And the way that it's portrayed in the set by Todd Rosenthal is really extraordinary and cool. And yes, it is based on a true, on a real place, not quite as um, kind of crazy as it's presented in the play, but th there was a consignment shop that I bought uh, my first tuxedo at, a used tuxedo when I was like a junior in high school um, called Armand's Echo in, in a neighborhood in Cleveland Heights. And um, I always I always laughed at that name. I thought that name was so interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I named this place Armand's. And then I, I invented a little armadillo that is the namesake of the place. Um, and so, yeah, armadillo has sort of um, become our little uh, our little mascot for this play. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Dean James takes place over a period of 12 years and a fabulous DJ Chloe Janelle sets the time and mood of each scene with songs. How were they chosen? If I remember correctly, uh, Chloe was not in the play originally. We, we added them about uh, a week or two in um, at Kenny Leon's behest. And then um, the songs that I want to say were chosen by Kenny and yourself, right? Or, or was it mostly Kenny? Was it most? But I, 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 yeah, I had, a, I had a playlist that I had given to Kenny and, um, you know, um, our, our sound designer, Michael Bodine. And so they used one of those songs from that playlist in, in, in this, What's the Difference by Dr. Dre, which starts the second half. Um, but the rest of the songs were chosen by Kenny and Michael Bodine. And, and they really put together an extraordinary mix of music that really brings it in. And I had, I had talked to Kenny about, you know, a national anthem to begin the show, because that was always one of the things I like about sporting events is that there's this ritual of the presentation of colors and the national anthem. And I've, I've always, you know, just from a purely like artistic point of view, like in, when I had season tickets, to the Brooklyn Nets, I would see so many games and I would, I was always amazed at like the varieties of the ways the anthem was performed. But, you know, Kenny reminded me of probably the greatest rendition of the national anthem ever performed at a sporting event, which was Marvin Gaye in the 1983 all-star game in Los Angeles in the forum. It's on YouTube. If you, if you can, if, if you want search Marvin Gaye national anthem and he comes out there, he looks like a million bucks on his sunglasses <laughs> and sings this really extraordinary and gorgeous version of the national anthem, which is what we begin our play with. And uh, I always really love that we do that with this play. Yeah. Rave about your favorite sports star or bar, your choice, go. <laughs> uh, growing up, my, my idol uh, of sorts was Michael, Michael Jordan. Michael Jeffrey Jordan, I thought that he- He could... played for the, the Bulls? <laughs> he played for the Wizards, right? <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure the listeners know that you're joking. But um, um, yeah, he's, you know, I thought of Michael Jordan as, the greatest of all time. And I'm going to say a little something about, about the GOAT conversation. Every time I I think that there's like a, a GOAT, right? There's a, it, it's funny because it's generational, right? You have Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who many say we never think we'd see someone who would eclipse him in points. And we're seeing that LeBron did that. You have Michael Jordan, right? Who, who for all intents and purposes, people have thought of as the GOAT over the last since he's, you know, since he was at his peak and since he's retired. Um, but you have people like Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. And even if you go to sports, you got 
you know, uh, Peyton Manning and Joe Namath and Tom Brady. The GOAT conversation is one that I think is never going to end. Like it's not supposed to end. Like we we engage in this conversation, you know, as if one day you're going to say, I'm going to convince you Michael is the GOAT. And you're going to go, you're right, I'm done. Right. Or you're going to convince me that LeBron's a GOAT. Okay, I'm done. Like it's, I, I listen to Stephen A. Smith or I listen to Dwayne Wade and they say stuff like, I don't care what LeBron does. He's amazing, but you will never convince me that he is a GOAT. Because in many times it's because how old were you and where were you in your basketball watching life or your own evolution as a man when you were watching this perceived goat, right. this specimen, right? right? So I watched Michael Jordan when I was coming into manhood, when I was coming into being who I am. So in many ways, he influenced the person that I am today. Right. That cannot, you know, that cannot ever be penetrated by someone who I watch mostly entirely as an adult. Yeah, who's so, older than? Yes, who I'm older than. Yeah. And, you know, who I've who I've seen them grow up. Right. I've watched LeBron, you know, come into his own, whereas um, Michael Jordan was all he was ahead of me. Yeah. So we we have these conversations and I think they're fun and they're great. But many times it's not even about the facts. You know, I could say, you know, LeBron is 20 years in. He's had the, the longest careers that he's, he's never been injured, all the things. And then someone else might come in and say, yo, know, Michael Jordan was a killer. <laughs> he went six for six. Yeah, LeBron, you know, beat three guys in game seven. Well, Michael Jordan never had to play a game seven because he was the beat. You know what I mean? Like we're going to go back and forth. And I think it's so I think it's fun. But I think it's also in, in, at least uh, uh, for men, um, uh, um, primarily the types of guys that you're talking about in this play. It's a way that we relate. It's yeah. not meant to end. It's not meant to convince. It's meant to like lose your shit and be like, no, dude, what are you talking about? But it's a way of actually saying to the other person, I appreciate you. And I, I want to be engaged in this dialogue with you. But anyway, I want to say that about the goal conversation because I, I, you and I have it all the time. I think it's fun. I think it's great. I think it's a lot of what the play is about, but it's a way in to, yeah. re really, to really say, Rajiv, I appreciate who you are in my life. And vice versa. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I think there's a beauty to it, but yeah. um, I don't drink. So I don't, I haven't spent a whole lot of time in bars over the years, but I would say Michael Jordan um, growing up was, was, is the person who I idolized. I'll address the bar question. Um, and I'll say, I'll do two. Cause I'll say West coast. We have to, we have to give a shout out to rush street, rush street, oh, yeah. was Rover city <laughs> bar that you and I and Brad and Ari went to, to watch those games, you know, it's still there. It's still, still there. there. Yeah. Great sports bar in Culver city. It's and a, Bro, you don't know this, but it's a Chicago bar. Oh, right? Rush oh, Street, right. Over City. Yeah. We've been to the other Rush Street that's down in like uh, the Viagra Triangle area of uh, exactly. Chicago, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then in New York, there's, so there's, there's a lot of sports bars in New York. A lot of them have closed lately since the pandemic. My favorite one in Brooklyn was called the Carriage House. That sadly closed. Um, uh, the one I probably go to still is Smith's on uh, 44th and 8th Avenue. Great yeah. spot, seen a lot of sports there. Uh, there, was a, there was a bar in Chelsea, I don't remember the name of it, and it's now closed, but that's where I watched game seven of the 2016 finals with Brad Fleischer and Andrea Hebler and um, watched my only, my one and only Cleveland championship of my lifetime. So that was really yes. special for me, but it has closed, which I don't think is a good sign for any more Cleveland championships coming around the bend. <laughs> I will give a shout out to my favorite theater bar uh, mm -hmm. yeah, to watch sports in, I should say, is uh, Glass House. In, uh, That's on, good, yeah. On uh, 40, 47th Street. That's right. King James originated at Chicago Seven Wolf Theater. Both of you are longtime members, and Glenn, you are now co-artistic director. How is the company evolving with new artistic leadership, Glenn? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll can answer this one pretty pretty easily. I would say that we've we've never it's a new model. So we've never Step Wolf is a uh, company of about fifty members, and um, shared leadership has been something that most times theaters don't really uh, um, ascribe to. Um, because you usually have one person sort of make calling the shots like any company and then uh, um, 
create on the artistic side and then an executive director or a managing director on the financial side. I would say that our model is is still evolving, but it's new. We're two years in, myself and Audrey Francis, who's my partner, who's amazing. Uh, she's an actor, I'm an actor. She's a director, I'm a producer. So we both have other lives. And uh, shared leadership allows for us to have full lives artistically. I'm here, here in New York doing King James right now because um, because of the shared leadership model where Audrey is back in Chicago uh, running uh, running the show day to day. So I think in that in that way, it's been um, hugely advantageous for us and our company. It also allows us to have different perspectives. You know, I might say I might be beholden to one community because of who I am and how I how I interface with uh, theater itself. Audrey might come from another uh, um, m another vantage point and brings a whole different skill set and ideas and ideologies to it. So I think the two of us being able to pull from each other and cover each other's blind spots, blind spots to some degree is um, is is really helpful. So yeah, I love I love the leadership model to your question and it is um, it is ever evolving. You're like mom and dad. <laughs> You both worked with the late, great Robin Williams on Bango Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo on Broadway. Please share your funniest memories. I'll do mine real quick. Um, so Robin, this this is a sort of repeated memory, but I remember one day specifically the, uh, when we were doing, we were rehearsing at, um, we were rehearsing a second stage in for Bango Tiger? Where, no, where no, we? we rehearsed at the, the 42nd Street Duke. Yes, yes. Um, 40 Street, yes, 42nd Street Duke Theaters, yes. Um, so I remember rehearsing there and Robin did, had this amazing sort of stream of consciousness humor. Like he would just go and it just never stopped. And so I describe it like this, the best way I can, I can say, there's a period in which any uh, comedian is riffing on a joke or on a theme. And it's sort of going like this here, and it's it's sort of escalating and escalating. He can pick things up and pick pick something up, uh, pick something else off that same idea in the room, and he can make another joke out of it, make another joke. Out of it. Robin would hold us hostage in a good way um, in the rehearsal room. So Moises Kaufman, who'd be directing, he would just sit back and just be laughing, and we're all dying watching Robin do his bit. And Robin's joke would be like this. It, it, continue to ascend, ascend, ascend. And then there comes a point where the joke just isn't as funny anymore. And so then you go, okay, it's not as funny. It's starting to, it's starting, it's plateaued and now it's starting to go like this a bit. And you're like, all right, it's not as funny as it was two minutes ago or five minutes ago. We can probably get back to rehearsal pretty soon. But Robin did not pay attention to any of that. He just kept going and he would. And so I remember this one day where he's going probably for about 10, 15 minutes on this joke. 10 minutes of it was funny. And then it started to sort of de-escalate. And you could see Moises getting a bit antsy, like, all right, we should probably get back to rehearsal. <laughs> well, just when you think Robin has lost the joke, <laughs> it's time to move on, he finds something else in the room. He picks it up and he goes on for another 10 minutes. And it's even funnier than it was before. That was his genius. He yeah. never gave up. He never let it go. You'd have to pull him off and say, all right, Robert, Robert, we got to go. But if you let him go, the genius of Robert Williams, that stream of consciousness humor will find something in the room to turn into another joke and entertain us for another 10, 15 minutes. He was yeah. brilliant at that. I'll say that like, this is not about him being funny, but actually about him being really thoughtful. Um, because I, when I, the day I met him, I met him the day before our first rehearsal, and it was at a brunch. And it was me and Moises and all the, all the producers and the investors, you know, money people. And he spent that whole brunch doing exactly what you're talking about: stream of consciousness, making us all laugh, just nonstop, just like we always saw him on the talk shows and everything. And it was almost exhausting, you know. Yeah. And then that night, we all were going to meet meet up. A bunch of like you and Harach and Sheila and Nakar had all come from LA. You had just arrived from LA. Me, Arian, and Brad were all living here. Us, the company of Bengal Tiger, had been working together for almost three years at that point. And Robin was the only newcomer. And Arian texted me and he was like, hey, man, we're all meeting tonight. Tell Robin to join us. 
And I was like, there's no way he's going to come. But I said, hey, Robin, you know, tonight we're meeting at this bar at like nine o'clock if you, if you want to come and say hi. And then I showed up at that bar at 8.55 and he was sitting there alone in a, in a rounded booth waiting. And then we all started showing up and it was an entirely different person. It was not the guy who was trying to make everyone laugh, but he was inquisitive. He wanted to get to know everybody. He wanted to, for all of us, especially you guys, the actors, to talk about the experience of doing this play, what it feels like doing it. He was very conscious that he had, that he had taken another actor's role um, our beloved actor, Kevin Ty, who had played the tiger the first two years. Um, and he was he was just full of curiosity and interest in all of us. And that's the Robin that I know and love because, you know, he is hilarious and he is a comic genius. But what made him a special person and a special actor was his deep curiosity and interest in, in his fellow company mates in that play. And um, that's really what was special about him to me. Yeah. I second that. Last question. What's the best deal you ever got at the TKTS booth, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this June? <laughs> um, you know that, Glenn? You ever been to TKTS, Glenn? You, you, roll in the, you roll in the dough, man. So you probably don't go for those, uh, this kind of tickets like me. Yeah, I have, I've never stood in the booth, but uh, uh, in line for the booth, but I'm sure they have some great deals, and I encourage people to do so. I'll tell you, mine was um, a few years ago, back in 2002, before I had gone to NYU, before I had even had a notion of being a playwright, um, my brother, who's an orchestral musician, was graduating from Juilliard. And my parents came into town and we went to his graduation and they had um, a bunch of other, like, you know, people that were up on stage that were getting honorary degrees from Juilliard. And one of them was Edward Albee. And, um, and I knew who he was, but I, you know, I didn't know him well. I, I knew that he wrote Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? That was about it, you know? And that afternoon we were like, let's go see a play tonight. So we went to TKTS and we were looking at all the musicals and all that. And we were like, The Goat or Who is Sylvia? Oh, that's by Albie. We just saw Albie on stage. Let's go to that. So we got cheap tickets to see The Goat, me and my parents and my brother not knowing anything what that play was about. Yeah, that's a heck of a play to watch with your parents. <laughs> oh my Lord. Oh my lord! Um, but we all really enjoyed it. Um, it was great, and I always liked that 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 play was called "Who Is the Goat" or you know, "The Goat" or "Who Is Sylvia." You know this double thing. And I I have thought about renaming this play that we're doing "The Goat" or "Who Is the Goat." Of course, of course, I saw that one a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you notice I have not engaged you once on this. <laughs> To go. I just want to appreciate LeBron for his brilliance because, you. you know, it's been 50 years. Might be another 50 before the next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. It was this was wonderful talking with you, Glenn, on this great uh, platform for TDF. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all soon at the theater. Yeah, please, please come see King James. It is a very it's a high flying play and you get some um some wonderful theatrics and even if you don't like uh, uh sports it is a play for everyone so um manhattan theater club at city center until the end of june